On the 14th of November, 2003, astronomer Mike Brown and his team discovered the most significant object found in the solar system since Neptune. No, not that one. Eris was important, but its importance was largely cultural, forcing us to realign our relationship with the universe in ways we may not have liked. But from a scientific standpoint, its importance was minimal. It wasn't the first object of its kind to be found, merely the largest, and, like the others of its group, its origin and evolution are fairly evident. What confronted Brown on that day would have immense scientific implications, powerful enough, perhaps, to blast open our understanding of the solar system. As with most moments when the universe changes, Brown's first reaction was simple confusion. Likely what he was seeing was a mistake. One of the hundreds his computer threw at him every day to be checked by his more discerning human eye. But if it was real, that would mean it was the farthest object ever found in the solar system, more than twice Pluto's distance from the sun. Even as it revealed itself as real, it still felt enough of a ghost for Brown to nickname it the Flying Dutchman, after the phantom ship cursed to sail the seas for all eternity and never return home. That the Dutchman was found so far beyond the known solar system was not unexpected. Indeed, Eris would eventually be found even farther out. But Eris was an ordinary member of the Kuiper Belt, at the outermost edge of its distended orbit. The Dutchman, as Brown and his team would eventually learn, was nowhere near the outer reach of its orbit. In fact, it was about as close to our sun as it would ever get. With each careful measurement, the Dutchman's orbit slowly unfolded before their eyes, and the final picture was staggering. Its path around the sun was a vast ellipse 936 AU across, that's about 140 billion kilometers, that took a nearly inconceivable 11,400 years to complete. Until then, only comets were known to have orbits that gigantic. But this was no comet. It was a substantial object, fully half the size of Pluto, and, thankfully, unlikely to pass close to our planet in any conceivable future. When it came time to officially name the Dutchman, Brown chose a name in sympathy with its frigid, lonely existence. Sedna, the Inuit goddess who had been abandoned by her father at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. But Sedna's gargantuan orbit was not what made it unique. As noted before, comets often have far larger orbits. Comet West has an orbital period of 250,000 years. In order to explain why Sedna's discovery was so world-shattering, I have to explain the Kuiper Belt, and how it, for lack of a better word, works. The Kuiper Belt, as outlined in greater detail in previous videos, is a large, donut-shaped region of space just outside the orbit of Neptune. About as wide as the distance between Uranus and the Sun, the Kuiper Belt is filled with small icy remnants from the formation of the solar system, including, yes, the former planet known as Pluto. But the Kuiper Belt is not a random swarm. Over the age of the solar system, it has been shaped into a number of different regions, the principal architect of which is Neptune. In fact, Neptune's influence on the Kuiper Belt is so great that NASA astrophysicists have suggested that, thanks to its effect on the dust within the belt, it may very well be the first planet in our solar system observed by extraterrestrial astronomers. The principal region of the Kuiper Belt is known as the Classical Belt, and it's basically what you think of when you imagine the belt in your head, a river of icy bits flowing in a merry circle beyond Neptune. The vast majority of Kuiper Belt objects found to date are in this region, including the first to be identified as such, 1992 QB1. Because of this, classical Kuiper Belt objects are often referred to as Q b one os I'm not joking. Most of the qb one os have remained in place since the dawn of the solar system, or very nearly after. The second region of the Kuiper Belt is the resonances. When a small object's orbital period is a precise fraction of a larger object's, like, say, Neptune, the large object can create an additional gravitational force that knocks the smaller one out of orbit. The metaphor most often used is pushing a child on a swing at just the right moment to send him higher. Because of this, the Kuiper Belt contains a number of grooves, like a vinyl record, where Neptune has removed or shunted any resonant objects out of the way. There are cases, however, when a resonance can actually protect an object from ejection. For instance, a special class of Kuiper Belt objects lies in the 2-3 resonance with Neptune, i.e., for every two orbits they make around the Sun, Neptune makes three. Normally, Neptune would have long swept that region clean of objects, but because they are locked in the 2-3 resonance, 
Whenever they make one orbit around the sun, Neptune makes one and a half, meaning that they will always be on the other side of the sun when Neptune crosses their path. The largest of this fortunate club is none other than Pluto, and in recognition, its members are referred to as the Plutinos. The final group of Kuiper Belt objects, and the most crucial for this discussion, are the scattered objects. They are the objects that, either by passing through an unfortunate resonance, or simply being the victim of the chaos of the early solar system, were ejected by Neptune into wild, careening orbits, sometimes hundreds or even thousands of AU distant. Eris, with its 97 AU orbit, is a member of this group. It is from here that the rain of comets into the inner solar system is believed to originate, as Neptune occasionally catches these Carini oddballs and sends them flying inward, becoming first centaurs and then short-period comets. Sedna was, and officially still is, placed in this group, which superficially makes sense. Its orbit does bear a striking resemblance to the orbits of the scattered objects, except for one crucial difference. All the scattered objects, however vast their orbits, have similar perihelia, or closest approaches to the Sun, of between 30 and 40 AU. In other words, close enough to Neptune to be disrupted by it. Sedna's perihelion is 76 AU, more than double Neptune's orbital distance. There is no conceivable way that Neptune could have sent Sedna into its current orbit. In fact, as far as the solar system was understood at the time, Sedna should not have existed. It was as if some mischievous god had plucked Sedna from the ether and set it on its path just to taunt us. That, or something fundamental, was missing from our solar system. Exactly what that something was remained a matter of debate. Some, including Brown and his team, suggested that Sedna had been pulled into its orbit by a star in the sun's birth cluster. It is now known that stars form in clusters, which gradually spread out into the galaxy. Recent iron isotope studies have shown that our solar system formed in the presence of many nearby supernovae. Perhaps one of these stars just happened to pass a little too close to our solar system when it was forming, tugging Sedna into its new orbit. Computer models by Julio Fernandez show that the idea was at least plausible. Others suggested that the gravity of the passing star, idly brushing by the sun on its merry travels through the Milky Way, could have been the culprit. Some astronomers even proposed that Sedna could have been captured from another star system. But the most beguiling hypothesis was, of course, that it may have been dragged into its current position by an undiscovered planet in our solar system. Computer simulations of such a phantom planet range from an Earth-sized object only 100 AU out to a Jupiter-sized object as distant as 5,000 AU. But all these speculations were just that. Speculation. Sedna was a class of one. With a sample of one, it is impossible to formulate a viable, testable theory. And for nearly a decade, Sedna would remain an infuriating asterisk on the edge of our solar system. An early candidate for a possible companion to Sedna was 2000 CR105, a frozen bit of rock with an aphelion of 411 AU, or about half of Sedna's, and a suspiciously distant perihelion of 44 AU. Another object, 2004 VN112, had a perihelion of 47 AU and an aphelion of 586 AU. In 2006 and 2010, Rodney Gomes, an astronomer at the Brazilian National Observatory, suggested that these objects could have been pulled into their current orbits by a distant planet. But he was largely ignored, mostly because the object's perihelia were still barely close enough to Neptune that one could just imagine them having been disrupted by it. As far as the majority of astronomers were concerned, Sedna was still unique. And then, in 2012, that changed. That year, Astronomers Chad Trujillo, who had been a member of Brown's original survey team, and Scott Shepard, a prolific finder of cosmic odds and ends, who holds a discovery credit for about half the known moons of Jupiter and Saturn, found a second Sedna. Not only did this new object, dubbed 2012 VP113, or Biden for short, have an unusually elongated orbit at around 4,200 years, not only did it possess a perihelion too distant to be disturbed by Neptune, at around 80 AU, it also shared a peculiar similarity in an obscure orbital element called the Argument of Perihelion. One of the six numbers required to accurately plot an object's orbit, the Argument of Perihelion is the angle between the object's perihelion, or closest distance from the Sun, and its ascending node, or the point in its orbit at which it begins to rise above the ecliptic plane. In fact, 
Trujillo and Shepard realized that not only did Sedna and Biden share this trait, but all known objects with orbits greater than 150 AU and perihelia outside the orbit of Neptune. When confronted with a clustering like this, one of astronomers' first instincts is to blame the Kozai effect, a kind of wobble or shiver in an orbit generated by the gravitational influence of a more distant object. Problem was, so far as anyone knew, there was no more distant object, at least not now. If the objects had been corralled into one of these orbits in the past, say by a passing star, then the gravity of the giant planets would have reshuffled them by now. Whatever caused this was still causing it. In the paper announcing the discovery of Biden, Shepard and Trujillo proposed that a body larger than Earth at a distance of about 250 AU, about eight times Neptune's distance, could account for the effect seen. It was at this point that Mike Brown became interested. And when Mike Brown is interested in anything theoretical, he turns to Konstantin Batygin. Konstantin Batygin is a modern answer to the wunderkind theoretical astronomers, like John Couch Adams or Urban Le Verrier, who first mapped out the outer solar system over a century ago. Born in the Soviet Union, he emigrated to California in 1999 at the age of 13 and attended UC Santa Cruz. His undergraduate thesis on the long-term dynamical stability of the solar system earned him the Lauren Steck Award. He attained his PhD at the strikingly young age of 26 and an assistant professorship by 28. Oh, and he's also in a rock band. But he can point out to Brown that the clustering of argument of perihelion was only a fraction of the true picture. Arguments of perihelion depend on the direction a planet is traveling in, and so say nothing about the direction in which an orbit is actually pointing. But Batygin showed that not only did these distant orbits share similar arguments of perihelion, they were actually pointing in a similar direction. Not only that, but they also had similar inclinations. They all lay in the same plane relative to the plane of Earth's orbit. Six objects sharing one aspect of their orbits could be considered a quirk, but sharing both? Batygin calculated the chance of such an alignment happening randomly at 0.007%. Other ideas to explain this pattern, in particular the collective self-gravity of the Kuiper belt, fell by the wayside, and more and more Batygin and Brown began to suspect that the culprit had to be an unknown planet between 10 and 20 times the mass of Earth, about the size of Neptune, lying about 700 AU, or 25 times Neptune's distance, from the Sun. Such a planet would have an orbital period of between 10 and 20,000 years, meaning its seasons were as long as recorded history. Given its similar size to Uranus and Neptune, Brown and Batygin speculated that it would be similar in composition as well. Uranus and Neptune are often referred to as the ice giants, because their interiors contain a larger percentage of what planetary scientists call ices, water, ammonia, methane, than the far larger gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. Thus, this new planet was most likely an ice giant, too. Incidentally, the term ice in this context has nothing to do with freezing. Most of the ices in Uranus and Neptune's interiors are superheated fluid, but they're still called ice. Brown and Batygin named this hypothetical object Planet 9, both to shed the historical baggage of Planet X and to annoy the remaining advocates for Planet Pluto. Thanks to a computer simulation that ran the Kuiper Belt's evolution through the past 4.5 billion years of the solar system's existence, they were able to show that Planet 9 was capable of shepherding orbits in just the way that they had seen, but a number of quirks nonetheless revealed themselves. First, Planet 9's orbit was pointing in the opposite direction to where they had expected. After all, you see a group of objects pointing in one direction, you assume that whatever is pulling them was in that direction too. But it turned out, to produce the clustering observed, any planet would have to share the same relationship with the observed objects that Neptune shares with the Plutinos, a safe resonance, protected from being scattered away. Second, every simulation they ran produced a population of high-inclination trans-Neptunian objects that were nearly perpendicular to Earth's orbit, and nearly at right angles to the original cluster, what Brown called the wings. At first, they thought the wings were a death knell for their planet, as they had never heard of such objects. But trolling through past papers reveal that such a population of near-perpendicular trans-Neptunian objects did indeed exist. Their hypothesis had done what scientists always hope, make a successful prediction. Further examination of the data showed that their planet could explain a number of the solar system's mysteries, including, yes, the abnormally distant perihelia of Sedna and Biden. Gravitational tugging of the outer Kuiper belt by Planet 9 would produce long-term pulses in orbital distance drawing some objects outward before sending them back again. It would mean that in a few hundred million years, 
Sedna would be a normal member of the Kuiper Belt again, though that prediction could not be checked so easily. To Brown and Batikin's surprise, Planet Nine solved a mystery of many years' standing, the obliquity of the solar system. The material in orbit around the Sun mostly lies in a single flat plane, called the ecliptic. This plane is believed to have co-formed with the Sun, in which case it would lie parallel to the Sun's equator, but it doesn't. For reasons until now unknown, the ecliptic plane is tilted with respect to the Sun by a full six degrees. None of the known planets could explain this deviation, as they all lie within the same plane. But Planet 9, which Brown and Batigan calculated was inclined to the ecliptic by as much as 30 degrees, could induce a multi-billion year wobble in the solar system's rotation axis, which could easily produce the tilt we are now seeing. This was all well and good, but it wasn't enough to just conjure a crazy, tilted, exiled shadow planet out of the ether. Where could such an epic-spanning oddball have even come from? How could the same forces that shaped our orderly clockwork solar system also produce something like that? Well, it turned out there was a possible answer, one deduced before Planet Nine was even proposed. In 2005, a trio of papers from an international collaboration of astronomers developed what became known as the Nice Model, named after the city in France where it was conceived. The Nice Model was an attempt to explain a number of odd features in the solar system in one rollicking event. According to its formulators, after its formation, the solar system was a far more compact and busy place than it is now. The four giant planets were huddled far more closely together, meaning that the planet region had about half its current radius. The Kuiper Belt began where Uranus is now, and contained far more material, up to 35 Earth masses, or enough to make two planets the size of Neptune. Every now and again, bits of debris from this proto-Kuiper Belt, called planetesimals, fell inward and were scattered by the two more distant planets, Uranus and Neptune, which would then pass them down to Saturn, which would then pass them down to Jupiter, which would then most likely kick them out of the solar system. It's important to note here that Jupiter is more massive than everything else orbiting the Sun put together. Twice. So its effects were always going to be more dramatic. Over the course of hundreds of millions of years, the minuscule kicks these interactions gave to the planets added up, and Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune began to move outward, while Jupiter moved very slightly inward. Eventually, Saturn and Jupiter found themselves in a 1-2 to two resonance, and, like the proverbial child on a swing, Saturn was pushed into a higher orbit, and, because gravity isn't fair, the two smaller outer planets, the ice giants, were sent careening even further outward. In some formulations, they even switched places, but either way, the end result was that Neptune was sent spiraling into the massive proto-Kuiper belt. If you want to envision the result, imagine a snowstorm in which every snowflake had the impact force of a thousand nuclear bombs. This was the late heavy bombardment, the storm of impact events whose scars can still be seen on every solid object in the solar system to this day. By the end, the solar system had doubled in size, the Kuiper belt had been reduced to 1% its former mass, and both Jupiter and Neptune had gained some extravagant bling. Jupiter had its Trojan asteroids, wings of asteroids trailing in its orbit, almost as numerous as the main belt itself, while Neptune, as well as a few Trojans, gained its giant ex-Kuiper belt object moon, Triton. But there were problems with the Nice model. For one thing, it turns out it is remarkably difficult to shift the orbit of Jupiter without it having some effect on the terrestrial planets. Many formulations of the Nice model sent Mars screaming off toward the Sun, potentially on an impact course with Earth or Venus. Obviously, that didn't happen, so formulators devised a far less apocalyptic alternative, the Jumping Jupiter model. Yes, that is what it's called. In the Jumping Jupiter model, rather than a smooth series of tiny kicks from planetesimals, Jupiter and Saturn's orbits are shifted in a series of big jumps, after getting one or two gigantic kicks from an incoming ice giant. This more rapid shift in orbit saved the blushes of the inner planets, allowing for pleasant outcomes such as our existence. But again, there was a problem. In many formulations, Jupiter jumped a bit too much, sending the ice giant flying out of the solar system. Since our solar system currently has two ice giants accounted for, again, that obviously didn't happen. Except, what if it did? What if, rather than one of the two ice giants we currently have, Jupiter had sent a third ice giant out of the cosmic ballpark. In 2011, long before Planet Nine was a twinkle in Mike Brown's eye, 
A modified version of the Nice model was proposed that comprised not four giant planets, but five. Formulators of the five-planet Nice model gave little thought to what would have happened to the hapless solar scapegoat after it had been ejected, but there is no reason to assume that it didn't eventually find its own perch, out in the blackness of the solar wilderness. Brown asserts that there is only one telescope on Earth fully up to the job of finding Planet Nine, the Subaru Telescope on Mauna Kea. Despite what you're thinking right now, the Subaru is not sponsored by the Japanese corporation known for its defense contracting and cheap cars, but is the primary telescope of the National Observatory of Japan. The word Subaru is, in fact, the Japanese name for the Pleiades star cluster. The reason it is uniquely suited to find Planet Nine is its 900 megapixel Hyper Supreme Cam, a camera taller than a person capable of imaging comparatively vast swathes of the sky at the faint magnitudes needed to observe Planet Nine. Brown believes 20 nights of observation at the Subaru should be enough. Don't get too excited, though. 20 nights of observation at one of the most in-demand telescopes on Earth means the search will take up to two to three years, assuming a very enthusiastic Japanese collaboration. So, is there a Planet Nine? Brown certainly believes so, so much that he has staked on it his reputation as one of the world's best-known and respected astronomers. There are, of course, skeptics, as there should be. It's not like false hope hasn't led us down this path before in the last 150 years. A recently discovered small object with a 20,000-year orbit has offered some doubt, because simulations show that Planet Nine, if it exists, would have ejected the object from the solar system. But even if there isn't a Planet Nine, that doesn't mean our solar system has nothing left to hide. Even now, there is some evidence that Planet Nine may be a misnomer, since there could be another object out there, far closer to home. By the early 2000s, it was becoming increasingly clear that something was off about the Kuiper Belt. Simulations have suggested that the amount of material beyond Neptune should increase dramatically the further out one looked. Instead, after about 50 AU from the Sun, the observed material just... stopped. It was as if we had swum out past the final reef, and found ourselves staring at the pure, dark depths of the open sea. Astronomers half-jokingly named this unnerving region the Kuiper Cliff, and to this day, no one knows why it's there. Until Biden was discovered in 2012, Sedna was the only known object with a perihelion beyond the Kuiper Cliff. With Biden added to the mix, the region is looking less like a cliff and more like a 25 AU wide gap. A clear neighborhood, as it were. One of the first to suggest that that region may be home to a missing piece in our solar system's puzzle was Patrick Lakauka, who, in 2008, while a lecturer at Kobe University in Japan, formulated a history of the solar system that included an unfortunate planetesimal about half the size of Earth that was kicked out of the known solar system by Neptune. It then proceeded to wreak havoc on the outer solar system, carving the Kuiper Cliff and sending objects like Sedna into their current orbits. It is important to note at this point that many of the phenomena explained by Lakauka's model are also explained by Planet Nine or the Nice model which goes to show you that mathematical models should only be regarded as suggestions until tested by observation. Our solar system is a wondrous, baffling, maddening place. Since we first realized it was there, it has and will continue to throw perplexing and infuriating mysteries at us that will force us to completely rethink and reconstruct it, continuously redefining our position in the place we call home. It is also far larger than most people think. The sun's gravity extends a full 100,000 AU out. Plenty of room for hidden surprises. Whether Planet Nine exists or not, it is unwise to become comfortable with the solar system you know. As history has shown, it never lasts long.